Welcome back to Canadian Justice, where we are discussing the decision in the Jordan Peterson Freedom of Expression case against the College of Psychologists. Now, Joanna, one thing that stood out to me in this case, which we've referenced a little bit in an earlier segment, was just how little weight the College of Psychologists gave to the right to freedom of expression. In ordering the retraining, the college, you know, they're supposed to weigh Dr. Peterson's charter rights and their statutory obligations to regulate the profession. But they basically had this one throwaway line essentially saying, Dr. Peterson has a right to freedom of expression, but, and that was about it. That was the analysis, a mere glance towards the charter. How on earth could this be sufficient consideration of his charter right? And how could that, that bare minimum constitute reasonableness in this decision? Yeah, I think that you, so I think the answer is this deference issue that we've touched on, Doré, that really this court said, you know, we're going to be very deferential and we're going to assume if there's any indication on the record of the decision that charter rights were considered, that they were considered. Now, normally courts um, don't really accept that. That's quite facial. And the Canadian Constitution Foundation in our inter intervener submissions said that where charter rights are engaged, the regulator has a heightened duty to actually grapple with the impact of the restriction on the charter rights. Um, but I think essentially this court was just happy to be deferential and take the regulator, the disciplinary committee's decision at their word. For me, that's not good enough. George, on a sort of related note, one thing that was strange to me about this case is I think is if the government itself were to be the one to impose this remedial penalty, non-discipline action, if they had done it itself, just, you know, this mere glancing at the charter, this one throwaway line about freedom of expression, that would not have been enough. But because the regulator is empowered by statute, they get a lift different, lower <laughs> standard of review. So they can get away with limiting rights more than the government itself actually could. So how does that make sense? It does. I mean, I mean, short answer, if it was the government who did it, the standard would have to be practice. How do you apply the charter as against uh, his individual rights? Here you've got the vavilov Dore deference standard, which was, uh, you know, uh, bizarre to all of us looking at it, or many of us who practice in this area, when it was introduced. I mean, there's too much deference given when you're dealing with the charter issue. And going back to the, the analysis of the uh, review committee here, there wasn't one to, jo uh, to Joanna's point. And the court, I don't know, I don't know how they did their analysis because on the one hand, they talk about what Vavilov said, which was a Supreme Court of Canada decision about how to deal with reasons and reasonableness and how do you figure out if the decision's reasonable. And they cite the terms justification, intelligibility, and transparency which is what comes out of Babylon, and you see none of that in terms of the charter analysis on Dory, and none of that. And, and you know, Dr. Peterson's counsel at, at, at the divisional court hammered that point home, I thought did a very effective job, and the court just didn't deal with it. Now, now we haven't got a huge amount of time left, but I'm going to pose this question because it's interesting to me coming from the court's analysis. They said that it wasn't necessary to engage with Dr. Peterson's comments and whether or not they were supported by facts or if they were his honest opinion, because they said that the concern came out of the language that he used, not the validity of his opinions. So to me, that reads sort of as it's not how, what you said, it's how you said it. And look, I have literally had that fight with my husband, but I don't think that it's the role of the court to be policing tone. But that seems to be what they're doing here. Joanna, in about a minute, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, the guarantee of freedom of expression is content neutral, right? So first of all, it doesn't matter if you're expressing a, a protected ground of expression. It doesn't matter if it's offensive, if you don't like it. And it certainly doesn't matter if you do it in an offensive tone, which, you know, again, you have this problem with a court several steps removed going in dissecting tweets that were probably composed extemporaneously, um, doing tone policing, as you say. And when you add the fact that this is off-duty conduct that no reasonable person would think had any close nexus with the practice of psychology, 
um, you have a very loose and very distressing standard. Now, when we come back from the break, I want to talk about something else, which is the, the notion that this mean tone could lead to harm to the profession and to the public without any actual requirement to prove that harm. We've got to go to break, but we'll discuss that when we come back.